This is uh, lavender quartz from Brazil. It's 12.8 grams, which is 60.4 carats. Multiply grams by five to get the carat weight. It's 20 by 15, but when you get the measurements from rough dealers, they're measuring it correctly. But even though this is 21 by 20 by 15, it's not really when you flatten out the pieces that stick out, it's not quite going to be that way. But that's as accurate as, you know, they're giving you accurate information when you're going to buy from the rough dealers. This one comes from Joe, Joe H, and he's a very good uh, rough dealer. I buy a lot from him. So I'm going to use Refractol which is a, a fluid, a liquid that has the same exact refractive index as quartz and lavender quartz is quartz. So what it will do is make the exterior pretty much disappear because it'll all be the same refractive index as a liquid as the stone. So it makes all this exterior, you know, the different shapes, cuts, you know, cracks, all, all disappear. So you can more easily look into the stone. So. Let me put it in the refractol and see what we can see. You kind of just see a shadow of the stone. I mean, it's because the purple shows up, that's your stone, but you don't see the all the exterior cuts and crevices and bumps and bruises and all that. So you see into the stone. So uh, what you see is a pretty clean stone. So you can see a couple of inclusions uh, fractures inside the stone here, down here, over here. Overall clean, I clean. Joe did a good job of representing the stone. Down there, there's one. Pretty clean, pretty good lavender color throughout, Not no zoning. Just, it's good to be aware of where the inclusions are as we try to cut this stone. It, it's probably too big for one piece. I don't need a, a 20 millimeter stone. Although many people want to cut larger, larger stones, they're great, but most jewelry applications are a little bit smaller stones. So probably going to cut this stone. And by knowing where the inclusions are, helps me decide where to cut the stone so that I get the inclusions out of the way. Okay, so after taking the stone out of refractol, the refractol is kind of an oily uh, substance. I don't know what's in it. To clean refractol off, after you've examined it, what I do is go to the sink and put immediately a uh, the drain plug in, <laughs> step one, and then use some dish soap, some uh, dish detergent that takes care of degreaser and rub it over the stone, wash it off, and it get, takes care of all the refractol. And the tip to use a drain plug first um, so the stone doesn't fall down your sink is probably the only tip that I've ever given you which is not from experience. I've never had the stone drop down the sink. The only bad thing that hasn't happened to me, I think. Otherwise, when I'm giving you a tip, uh, it's because I've done it the wrong way and learned from doing it the wrong way. But that's probably the first and only tip that, probably because it's common sense. So this is Refractol. Okay, Bubaloo Rock out of Saginaw, Michigan hasn't been in business in decades, or at least more than a decade. Um, it's Again, almost impossible. I think it's all been sold out of the market. Uh, I was able to pick up a bottle, an extra bottle, uh, earlier this year from the one dealer that I know that still has it. You have to call, it's John Frankie. He, the last time I talked to him, still had a couple of bottles left. He told me that he had bought out the distributor years ago of the last refractal, refractal that the distributor had. So. Um, as of now, he has had one or two bottles left, just a couple. I uh, haven't found anywhere else in the world where it's still available. There are some new mixtures of something called something like Refractol. It's not called Refractol, it's something else, but it's close. I, I don't think it's as good, in my opinion, as Refractol, but other people do. There's also cinnamon oil, wintergreen oil, different types of oils that have a different refractive index that depending on the stone uh, you may use, whatever works, but that's refractol. The quartz family includes amethyst, citrine, ametrine, which is a mixture of amethyst and citrine, clear quartz, several other varieties and colors of quartz, and rose quartz. Lavender quartz is one of the more rare types of quartz 
and it all comes from a single mine, the Boquira mine, which is in the Brazilian state of Bahia. I never made it to Bahia yet in my gem hunting. I got as far as the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil, and that translates to general mines because all the mines that are there. But the next state to the north is Bahia. Might make it there someday. Lavender quartz can be described as a lilac pink or lavender, and hence the name. Now I mentioned rose quartz earlier as one of the types of quartz because lavender quartz uh, appears to be closely related to rose quartz. It's been described as rose quartz with high level of titanium or manganese in it, which turns the color from a rose to a lavender. And that kind of explains why it's only found in one mine. Rose quartz is one of the most common varieties of quartz, but to have a mine of rose quartz with titanium and manganese present makes it quite rare indeed. So I want to use this big piece of lavender quartz to cut a prototype gem for Bopi for a special jewelry design she's working on. What I need to cut this into is, well, a parachute. This is the U.S. Army Parachutist Badge, and my mission from Bopi is to cut a gemstone into the parachute part of this badge. I spent a lot of time asking my fellow gem cutters for help, and I'd like to give a special thanks to Mr. Glenn Wood, a fellow member of the United States Fastening Guild, for finding the cutting diagram and instructions to this design for me. This is the design I need to cut. This design was created by Harold N. Bean and was published in the January 1990 edition of the Lapidary Journal. It's uh, freely available for any cutter to use, so if you like what I end up cutting, go ahead and get a, get a copy and uh, give, it a, give it a shot. This is a prototype cut. Bopi doesn't know the size of the gem she wants to work with, um, she just wants to see something cut into a parachute and then she can decide about the type of gemstone, the, the size, and etc. So for a prototype, I prefer to cut larger stones. That way Bopi can see the details more clearly. And since it's going to be a larger stone, I don't want it to be an extremely expensive type of gem material as the prototype may not turn out at all. So quartz and topaz seem to make some pretty great options. Okay, for our lavender quartz, I have preformed it somewhat by grinding down into the basic shape that I'm looking for. This is a prototype stone for Bopi, so uh, I wanted to get it generally close. The size of the stone really doesn't matter. It needs to be big enough for her to build her special piece that she wants to build, but what size it is at this point doesn't matter. She just needs to see if the shape is what she's looking for. I could have trimmed it with a trim saw, but I chose to use just to grind it down because I was taking into account some of the inclusions I was able to already grind out. Um, the others are um, think we're going to be okay. I wasn't too worried about it, but trimming when you try to get the rounded surface a little bit tough. So this is where we're at with the stone. It's about a 20 millimeter across on the round side right now. So I'm going to use epoxy because it's a large stone. Use epoxy to set it into the dot. Now, when we put it in the dot, we are probably about a, a nine millimeter dot is probably what I'm going to shoot for. So I want a dot about like that. That way I can grind the stone uh, as I need it, if I run into an inclusion, as I'm going through, I can make it a little smaller without having a problem. If I started with a, a 20 millimeter top, I wouldn't be able to grind much before I'd be grinding on brass. So I want to use this nine, nine and a half millimeter uh, top. So I've got a 20 millimeter dot. I'm not going to glue this dot with an epoxy to the stone, but the reason you use a large dot is that allows me to center the stone. I can now, on the big round part of the parachute, figure exactly where I want it, and it's going to be pretty well centered. Then when it's centered, and I switch to the smaller dot that I'm going to use in the transfer jig, it's going to be lined up and centered already. Otherwise, you try to center it, you might end up here, might end up there, it would be pretty hard to not center it that way, but you want to get it exactly centered. So start with an oversized dot and then move it out. Now on the bottom to hold the stone, as we push the 
the dock we're going to use onto the top, you know, it's not flat, so I use some putty. I'll put it in here and, and use that to help the stone can be adjusted a little bit to make sure it's flat against the top dock. I use uh, just modeling clay, putty, anything that is kind of, you know, plastic, uh, rubbery, gives a little bit like modeling clay will be fine. This is the modeling clay that I use. Any will work. I don't, it's just the first one I found. You know, it's only very inexpensive. Probably find it at the dollar store. Any modeling clay will work. Any kind of putty kind of stuff will work. And you can see I've got a lifetime supply. That's what I used and I just put it on the stone, the bottom part of the stone. Put that on the bottom dock. And that's gonna help hold the stone in place and be able to move the stone as I put the top part of the top in. Okay, so we kind of locked down the bottom part of the top with the uh, putty and then push the top top into the bottom, lining up the stone. It's now flat against our top. We center it, nice big top. It's easy to center it where we want it. We can slide the stone around in this in this putty without any problem. Kind of get it where we want it. Push it into the putty and you can even work the putty up the sides a little bit uh, making sure it's got a nice kind of mold around the uh, the lavender quartz and then we remove the large dot. That was just to help center it. So we've got the stone centered where we want it. So when you look at this design uh, on paper, you see the table and it has the that F mark in the center of the table. So that kind of shows you the center point uh, for your stone is kind of the center point of the ball, not taking the length and width and cutting in half, which would put the center further down. That, that's not the center point. Center point for cutting this design is the, the rounded part of the parachute. And you can see that where the 24 and 72 tooth and the 48 and 96 tooth teeth of the index cross and meet at where that F is for the table. That's the center point. So that's where we've got it lined up. And so we've removed the larger uh, 20 millimeter dot and now we're gonna put in our nine millimeter. The stone is kind of held in place. As long as you don't bump it, hit it or anything else. Kind of held in place by the, uh, the putty. We can now push the uh, nine and a half millimeter drop down and see that it's still centered on the rounded part of the parachute, not, not the, uh, where the, the risers go down to where the parachutist would be. So now we just uh, push the drop back up and we work on our two-part epoxy and then we'll be able to adhere the stone to the drop. For our lavender quartz that we're gonna cut into our prototype for our parachute design, the instructions call for the bottom of the parachute to be at the 96, top of the course at the 48. So you put your 96 tooth and you orient your parachute. So I think this is gonna be the bottom of our parachute when we're done. So I'll put that in our Ultra Tech. At this point, you can just eyeball it, it's perfectly fine. Then I tighten the set screw and we're all set. I'll start with a uh, 320 or a 360 grit topper and the first uh, start uh, preforming our parachute. I started preforming our stone in the Ultratech with a 360 topper lap and then went to a 600 topper lap. And now our parachute is pretty well preformed. Now I'll go to a 1200 grit lap and then a 3000 grit on a bat lap to pre-polish it and then I'll go to polish. I'm currently waiting on a new lap from Tom at Adamus Facet to replace my 1200 
and I had to wait for a production run which just finished so I should have it any day now. I'll let you know in a future video how that new lap works out. After our 1200 grit topper lap this is where we are with our parachute so now I'm going to go over it with a 3000 grit diamond on a bat lap and pre-polish it. I finished polishing the pavilion of our lavender quartz. The uh, dark side lap wasn't really giving me a good enough polish. I'm not exactly sure why. I was using um, cerium oxide on it. So I switched back to my uh, old standby, the uh, cerium oxide spectrum ultra laps, and they polished it up no problem. Then I cleaned uh, my dark side lap just with this, you know, the kitchen sink sponge that I keep just for it and dish soap. Did a couple facets with the uh, dark side lap with serum oxide and it seemed to have made the difference. Maybe it had a buildup of something in it, I'm not sure, but it, it wasn't polishing at first and uh, now it is. So I'll transfer our parachute so that we can cut the uh, crown. Okay, I've got a unique situation on our pavilion. Because of the, the slope of this long part of our kind of keel of our parachute and the other sides. This point is not exactly center. So, so if I use a, a round cone, it's going to hit here before it hits here. So it doesn't, it's not like using a round cone shaped off for a standard round brilliant type stone. It's not perfect. So I guess an option is to use a, a V-shaped dop and that'll resolve the problem here and then I'm only touching on the two sides with the V-shaped. I guess we could do that. There's still a, the V-shape is not the same shape as our stone so there's air spaces there. That would probably work too. But, I don't know. So I'm gonna try, I, I believe I'm just gonna use the cone shape. So I've put a little blue piece of putty in the bottom to protect our culet so from breaking off. And I'm gonna use a lot of epoxy, and not put any pressure on it, because I don't wanna end up with a crack right here from where this hits the brass top. So I guess, lots of epoxy and being gentle and we'll see how using a cone shaped top works out. Gonna fill the bottom cup with your epoxy. Push the top stone onto the bottom. But not too hard, I don't wanna crack that lavender quartz along the uh, that long culet or long keel. Don't really want to get epoxy on the uh, the girdle, but I do want a lot of epoxy. I'm a little worried about the way this the shape of our brass top compared to this uh, parachute stone. For a few minutes, I need to just turn the uh, transfer jig over and over so that the, uh, as the epoxy you know, flows based on gravity, it doesn't, we don't want it going down too far down the dock and we don't want it going, I don't really want it on the girdle. So, until the epoxy sets up, it's just a question of moving it around. So we'll let it set uh, overnight and uh, I'll work on another stone and then I'll come back and finish our parachute project. For our lavender quartz parachute pair, um, we finished the transfer and so we're gonna put it back in the uh, Ultratech machine into the uh, spindle and you want to align it. So the best way to align this particular cut is with the, uh, the two long sides where the risers go. So 
and these were cut at the index tooth for index gear of 16 and 80. So you want to put your tooth at 16 and set your angle at 90, which is flat. And then you put a flat piece of metal on top of your flattest lap, which is our ceramic. And at 16 index uh, tooth, you want to run it down until the flat part is flush with your our block here which is a precision block precision cut block and the only thing to remember is make sure uh, to check it 16 and 80 because otherwise you could get it backwards you could put it in the wrong flat part in which case that would be wrong so back to the 16 and instead of this flat part at 16 We want this flat part at 16. Otherwise you'd start cutting and you would have a giant mess. So that's at 16 and then you check it at 80. You change your uh, index tooth to 80 and that's the other flat part. So now you've got it properly aligned and you just uh, you just look uh, along you look along here and as you raise the armature, you want it to break. You'll see light all across it at the same time. If light is on one end and not the other end, you're not quite flat and you have to adjust it to your flat. And that, that way, when you finish that and you're in alignment, then you're ready to cut your crown so that your girdle will be uh, perfectly aligned. So I finished preforming the uh, upper half or crown of our lavender quartz parachute. So the 360 grit diamond on the top of our lap is all done. I'll go to a 600 grit and then a 1200 grit, 3000 and then to polish. So for the lavender quartz, I'm polishing it up and I want to show you the cheater and how it works on the Ultratech. So you can see the long facets these big facets, uh, it's common to have problems polishing it because they're so big that it'll polish on one side and the other side's not quite polished. So you can see that up here on this top facet that I'm working on. This part right here is polished and the rest of the facet is not polished. So what I need to do is turn the stone clockwise, moving this side down clockwise so that the part that's not polished will hit the lap. You can still you can still see it if I uh, move it and you can see the light. It's this part's polished, this part's not. So the cheater is right there on your altar deck. And if I want to turn the stone clockwise, you turn the cheater clockwise and then if you need to adjust it further you can and that let's see how that works by using the cheater on this uh, facet we've got it all the way polished now now cheater is not the official name it, in 5 Ultratech it's actually called the index vernier v-e-r-n-i-e-r -E -E vernier but everybody calls it a cheater and what it does is each of these is point zero point that degree of a change. So that's 0 0.2 degrees uh, moving it clockwise. And it's in relation to your index gear. So the index gear that I was working on is, is 80, but it wasn't quite right. So we wanted to move it clockwise. So 79 point eight degrees instead of 80 degrees is what we needed in the end to get that uh, facet all the way polished. So it's it's making very minor adjustments to, to your index, the tooth of your index gear is what this uh, index veneer does. Or cheater, which is what everybody calls it because it helps you cheat your way into getting a uh, good facet. The thing to remember is the direction that you want your, to turn your stone 
is the direction uh, you turn the cheater. It, it's common to get confused. So, you know, practice with it if you get a chance. If you, if you need to turn your stone, in our case, we wanted to turn it clockwise so this back part would touch the lap more than the front part. So we want to turn it clockwise. We turned our cheater clockwise. When you're first starting to practice with it, it gets very confusing. And the other thing that'll help you is mark your facet with a Sharpie, you know, permanent marker. So you can see where it's rubbing. If you go in the wrong way, that, that, that helps a lot also. Okay, I finished uh, polishing the crown or upper half of our lavender quartz and now I'm going to take it off and set it up to cut and polish the table, the top part of our parachute, and then we'll be done with our parachute. I did have problems, continuing to have problems with the dark side lap on this particular piece of quartz. Not sure why. I mean, it, it, does, it, it does a 99% good job of polishing, but leaves tiny cat hair scratches. So what I did is I simply changed to the Ultra Laps, cerium oxide Ultra Laps. These are plastic or mylar, I guess they call it, disposable laps that have cerium oxide embedded on them. The thing to remember is shiny side down and on your master lap, the lap you're gonna, gonna put under this Ultra Lap you know, put a couple few drops of water that holds it in place. And uh, the Ultra Laps uh, did a wonderful job of polishing our lavender quartz when the dark side wouldn't. But again, the dark side's been doing great on quartz. It worked great on amethyst and citrine. I'm not sure why it didn't quite work out with our lavender quartz. Okay, I finished polishing the table on our parachute. So now I'll remove the adhesive and uh, then we'll weigh it out, measure it, and uh, send it off to Bulky for her uh, special project. Parachute pair design is not overly difficult, but it's not really what I would recommend for a beginner. You have to get the length and width correct or else you're going to have uh, problems with some of the other facets. And those long facets sometimes give you problems. Again, I had to work with the cheater. But if you've cut a handful of stones, go ahead and uh, give this one a try. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, as far as polishing, I'm still stumped as to why my dark side lap with uh, cerium oxide would not give me 100% polish. And all I can think of is maybe the titanium and manganese that are in lavender quartz to make lavender quartz what it is. Maybe that affected the polishing. Ultra laps are, are mylar, and they, they have a little bit of give to them. You can't see it with the naked eye, but they, they kind of round facets uh, because there's a little bit of give to them as, a, as opposed to a, you know, a hard lap. Maybe that's what it took to get the lavender quartz to polish correctly. I guess I could have tried 50,000 grit diamond on a bat lap, and that always a uh, you know, last resort from the toolbox. But if anyone has an opinion as to why the uh, dark side wouldn't work, uh, I'd love to hear it in the comments. Again, uh, happy fastening, everyone.